Good evening, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 92nd Street Y and uh, Barry Sonnenfeld's book event. Hi, Jer. Hi, Bear. <laughs> and uh, probably the most uh, Jewish place outside of <laughs> Barry Sanders' medicine cabinet that you could be tonight. <laughs> what? Wait, start again. <laughs> Hi, Jerry. So, yeah. the reason I'm here is because Barry and I have known each other for, we were just trying to work it out, about 15 years, yep. let's say. Yeah, let's say. Uh, we, we really became friends in Colorado That's right. when I uh, got a house near Barry's and we started hanging out together. And actually, now that you know, um, Sue mentioned uh, Comedians in Cars, we kind of started to cook that idea up on one of our drives out there, Well, right? weirdly, weirdly, independently, we came up with the same idea. So Jerry and I would go driving in one of his cars, and we went to Rico, and we got out at this coffee place. Right. And Jerry said, uh, I have an idea for a show. And I said, I know the idea. <laughs> and you said, you can't know the idea. I haven't told you. And I said, I know the idea. And you said, what's the idea? And I said, you do an interview show in a car where you drive long distances and interview someone because the great thing about driving long distances is, A, it's totally banal, so you start to say things like, well, I guess you want to know about that time I had sex with a moose right. or whatever because you're just so <laughs> bored. But it's also dynamic because each time you pass a weird truck with the dead elk, right. you then have to get gas and then get back on and pass it again. So I said, that's your idea. It's an interview show in the car. Now, how many of you are aware of Barry Sonnefeld because of his work in Esquire magazine as the gadget guy who would review... <laughs> See that? I yeah. told you you should have stayed with that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I did it for 10 years and I never got above $1,000. I started 1000 a month. I ended 10 years later at 1000 a month. And at some point, Jared, there's just so many, you know, articles you can write comparing the Galaxy S Eight to the iPhone six, it yeah. just it gets boring. But he's one of those people that you can hand him any device of any kind, and he just click 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 click, and he can just figure out how to use it and what's bad, and then what's bad about it, <laughs> in, in two seconds. Well, that was the job I really wanted was to be hired by, let's say, General Motors, so and they could put me in a Chevy Tahoe, and I could go move that button here, have right. it dialed t for volume instead of a touchpad, but they wouldn't do that. And so. do you have issues with like the new iPhone, even something like that, which most people would say works pretty good? But pretty good isn't good enough. But is, it, is that how you would rate it? Pretty, just pretty good? I would say pretty good. Wow. All right. Yeah. He's tough. No. All right. So <laughs> we're here tonight to hype this book. Yeah. Now let's... <laughs> We're not here for any other reason. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start with um, why you even... Now, this is the first book you've ever written. That's right. But, and is this the first kind of entertainment uh, uh, prose, if that's the right word, that you've ever written? I mean, reviewing a, a Pentax, I wouldn't call that... <laughs> Can I just say how embarrassing it is that you went Pentax? What? Is that <laughs> well, a really you know, old camera? Yeah, yeah, it's really oh, old. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> At least go. But it's Icon. a great old name, right? It is. It's a old great name. old name. Yeah. yeah. I you didn't go said, Hanukkah. I was going to say Mamaya Secor, but I thought that was <laughs> no, too obscure. It, it is. Anyway, <laughs> so let tell the yeah. audience why yeah. you did this. And what is it, first of all? It looks like it's just basically the story of your life, the fun parts, right? Uh, not the child molestation stuff. No, not that, no. Not when the porno goes horribly wrong, not that either. Well, that's but fun when it's not your porno, though. <laughs> Us, your misfortune is our entertainment. No, that's Remember, true, that's true. Yeah, it, yeah. It's fun part for that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, here's what happened. Jared, you were very instrumental in me writing this book. Really? Uh, Jerry, uh, Jerry and Jessica and his family would come out to uh, Telluride every Christmas, New Year's, and we, would, we had a great screening room, and you guys would come over, and uh, we would watch movies, but he would also hear about the horrible experiences I was having 
uh, directing Men in Black 3. Mm -hmm. Studios, producers, actors, everything was just a nightmare. And on Christmas Day, uh, Jerry came over to my house, uh, called me and said, can I talk to you? Yeah, okay, come over. I would over. never say that, but go ahead. <laughs> Who would call someone and say, can I talk to you? Okay, all right, Jerry, <laughs> Jerry said. Supposedly a friend of yours. <laughs> I believe Jerry <laughs> said, can I come over? Even that I would never say, but I don't want to ruin your story. What, here's what I would probably say, what are you doing? Right. You would say nothing. <laughs> uh, I would say, want to have a cigar at 4 o'clock? Right. You would say yes, and then I would come over. I was just trying to be brief. Okay. <laughs> What happened was Jerry called up and said, what are you doing? I said, nothing. He said, you want to have a cigar at four? <laughs> I said, yes. He came over at four, and he said to me, you know, you would really love doing stand-up. You're totally, OK, Jerry, why don't you tell the story? <laughs> uh, no, 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 I'm really come on. fascinated. I, no, I, I just have to just make it sound a little more real. <laughs> <laughs> You probably said something. Here's, here's the truth, because we talked about this today on the phone. You, he said, do you think I could do stand-up? No. <laughs> no. No? That came later in the conversation. Okay. Now, you know Barry, how many people know Barry's many uh, very amusing appearances on the David Letterman show in the 90s? Saw him there. <laughs> That's bigger than the Esquire crowd. <laughs> So, Jerry, tell me all the reasons I should do stand-up. In my version of the story. Okay. Uh, you're in charge of your own success or failure. Uh, no one's telling you what to do. You get... he, he went on, and he was very persuasive. But then I said, aren't I too old to do stand-up? And Jerry said, you're way too old. <laughs> you, you won't make any money, but you would have a good time. Right. <laughs> But I so don't want that kind of pressure of people not liking me, Jer. Right. So instead, the closest I could do was to write this book, which is my version of writing stand-up. Plus, uh, the Esquire editor-in-chief, David Granger, mm -hmm. left Esquire, became a book agent, and said to me, uh, do you have a book in you? And I had previously written about my nine days shooting nine feature-length pornos. Right. And I had written a, a, a chapter just for fun. I've never heard feature-length before. <laughs> That's a very large penis. Yeah. It's a feature-length penis. Yeah, as a descriptor. <laughs> So I wrote that chapter years earlier just for something to do because you weren't around in Telluride and I was bored. So I wrote that chapter. And right. Please don't tell us about it. Oh, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you'll get to read about it. It's truly horrific. But in, in any case, uh, he said, you have a book in you. And I gave Granger that chapter. And he said, if you can write two more chapters, we can sell this book. Wow. So I wrote Barry Sonnenfeld, Call Your Mother, which is about what happened to me at 2.20 in the morning in 1970 at Madison Square Garden. That's a great story. You want to tell that story? That's a, I love that story. I'll tell it briefly. OK. But please interrupt if you have a better version. I will. I will. I, I, I would, it I would will. really help me. In fact, why didn't you offer to edit the book? <laughs> uh, uh, I was a senior at music and art high school. Uh, it was the first peace concert, Jimi Hendrix, Peter, Paul, and Mary, the cast of Hair. And uh, I told my mother I'd be back home at 2 and at 2.20 in the morning as Jimi Hendrix is warming up for the <laughs> second time because he was having his drug issues, so he had left and come back. As Jimi is about to hit his strings over the PA system, <laughs> Barry Sonnenfeld, call your mother. <laughs> And there, in, in that story, the history of Judaism <laughs> <laughs> in two minutes. <laughs> now, Jerry, are your parents alive or dead? Let's get funny here. <laughs> um, my parents are no longer with us. And you're sad about that? I'm just checking. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> 
No, I mean, they had wonderful, long, uh, nice, healthy, happy lives. And I'm not a greedy person. I try not to be. And I, I wouldn't. My mother lived to be 99. She, she did really? great. Really? Yeah. Uh, what, 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 what have my parents got to do with anything? Well, just that your parents kind of left you alone in the same way my parents didn't. Correct. And Correct. I, I always describe my upbringing as benign neglect. I, I, <laughs> I really felt like my parents were just letting me live there till I grew up. <laughs> <laughs> and which, of course, is something none of us are capable of no. in, in the current uh, uh, moment. But it's a true blessing that you, you oh, have. Unbelievable. Yeah. Because I just naturally became very uh, self-reliant and, and yeah. self-sufficient. That was not my parents. Right. Yeah. yeah. As you can tell from. Uh, yeah. <laughs> by the way, uh, you know, th there were no cell phones or anything like that, so it's not like she could have texted me. I mean, we're right. by 97. And what happened after that? Even though they, you... yeah. Well, so first of all, by standing up, <laughs> I announced to 19,600 people, <laughs> I am Barry Sonnenfeld, right? <laughs> And now I'm weeping uncontrollably because I know my father has died. Because, uh, no, no, he hadn't died. I assumed oh, right, right, he had yeah, died. Because right. how else does someone get someone <laughs> to page you at Madison Square Garden? It's not by saying my son said he'd be home at 2 and it's 2.20. So, uh, so I, I'm now Ooh, weeping. Okay. And of course, the blue seats who see that I've stood up, start the garden chant of Barry, <laughs> Barry, <laughs> which also doesn't help Jimmy's performance down below. <laughs> Cascades to the orange and the red seats. Now I'm weeping. I put the dime in the phone. I call Wadsworth 86160, and I say, is dad dead? <laughs> and, and my mother, who's also weeping, because she knows I'm dead, says, <laughs> Sonny, he's sound asleep. I said, well, why did you call me? She said, well, you said you'd be home at 2, it's 2.20. <laughs> I said, but didn't they tell you the concert was still going on? <laughs> yes, but they couldn't find you. <laughs> so that's the second book I, uh, chapter. And the third chapter I wrote was called Fear of Flying about various, you know, I was in a plane crash in 1999 where the crew abandoned the plane after we crashed and I was left alone on the plane. But earlier, <clears throat> my first experience was flying down to Miami on Eastern Airlines, remember Wings of Man? Sure. But uh, they uh, ran out of plane, so we were on Pan Americano. They had borrowed, a, a leased a plane from Mexico and my mother <laughs> somehow convinced the pilots because she had angina that uh, she was dying, so they dropped mask on the plane. So there's 105 swinging <laughs> yellow cups. And by the way, so they make an announcement, but A, it's bilingual, B, it's fat, so no one knows what's going on. And there are all these cups swinging, and my mother is sucking oxygen, <laughs> and I'm sitting next to her. So I've always had a fear of flying. Every time I get off an airplane, I, I view it as a failed suicide attempt to this day. <laughs> and we sold the book, and it will be out on Tuesday. Well, well, I think we're going to move a lot of them. Thanks, Barry. Um, you were t talking backstage. We were talking uh, with uh, my daughter, who's here, about uh, she's uh, 19, and you know, thinking about uh, so what are you supposed to do in life, and you know, is that Ter terrible torture of being a young person. And you were saying you went to NYU, and then you graduated, and then went to film school, still having absolutely no direction at all of what you wanted. No interest in film, no knowledge of what I wanted to do. <laughs> <clears throat> it's not funny. It's kind of, well, in a way, it's the way it should be. I mean. Yes, it's the way it should be. But you always knew you. I mean, when did you decide you wanted to be a stand-up comedian? Uh, when I was at Queens College, I was about 20 years old, and I was, I was going through the motions of college because I wanted to be the first person in my family to graduate college. I thought that would be nice for my parents. Right. Even though I had no interest in anything no. there. 
And uh, yeah, so I, I, I knew that. But um, they never even had a conversation with me about, so what do you think you might want to do? Right. Benign neglect. Nothing. Right. Nothing. And then when I was leaving the house, I, I'm, I'm sorry, this is not my no, I have please. a book about this. But yeah. I was leaving the house at like 1 a.m. to drive into the city. We lived out on Long Island. I, I would leave the house at 1 a.m. because I wasn't going to get on stage before 3 a.m. anyway. Right. And I was doing that for months. And uh, before they even asked, what, what are you doing? You know? <laughs> that is extraordinary. Yeah. And yeah. I said, well, I go to these comedy clubs in Manhattan. I'm trying to be a comedian. And... Um, they My mother said. said, well, then you should probably get a place in the city. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I left home. <laughs> what was your major in college? Uh, what, I had what was called Communication Arts and Sciences, uh, which was a film and uh, television and all that stuff. And we were, that's another thing we were talking about backstage, of, that you studied. Um, a film and yeah. at graduate school, and mm -hmm. that it's absolutely useless, <laughs> right, to attempt to teach. And and I'm at the point. I'm at a stage now, or you know, I've done these things, and I feel like I've got a lot of so much. I've I've learned so much over the years, as you have. And do yeah. you have? So I have this urge now that I want to pass it along to young people that are right. interested in in my profession, and I don't know if it's possible to do it. Do you think it's possible? Well, uh, in your case, maybe. Um, what, what do you mean? Well, you, you know, you're smart and entertaining, and you're not a professor. Right. So you probably can find a way into teaching that doesn't sound professorial or just bitter and angry. Right. I don't, <laughs> I, I don't see you being So bitter. you think the reason uh, that these schools don't work is because the people teaching it are not in the business themselves, so they don't really know how it what to do? Well, they were in the business, all fell down. Right, uh, right. And became right. so like our homeroom teacher in graduate school, you know, was a script supervisor on, uh, oh, you know, what's the thing with Brando? I could have been a contender. Come on, everyone. On the waterfront. So she right. was a script supervisor on, on the waterfront. The uh, cinematography teacher was a Czech guy who fled Czechoslovakia in 1960 and now is teaching. Ian Maitland, I should not mention his name, was an Australian who told us that the greatest movie ever made was The Sound of Music and we would just watch The Sound of Music over <laughs> So that's not teaching you that much. And the only way you learned at film school was by making movies. And, mm -hmm. and that's when you realize, oh, that's why you need a wide shot, or that's why you need an over the shoulder, or that's why you need this. So until you made movies, it was a waste of time. Once you made your bad movies, and at graduate film school, they were all about being alone, living in the East Village, and losing your girlfriend. Right. <laughs> Although, in my case, I had no girlfriend, so that part was fictional, but the rest of it was, you know, being depressed. But in your case, I think you might be able to inspire Fire them. Okay. Well, anyway. <laughs> um, so, I, I'm sure the audience is uh, curious. You've had really a fantastic, continue to have yeah. this amazing career. You've done all, things you never dreamed you would do. No. Um, I would like to hear, and I know they would like to hear, really, everybody wants to hear the origin story. All these right. superhero movies, the origin story is the only good story. Right, right. right? Spider-Man gets bit by the spider. That's, well, we just saw that. Over and over again. That's all we want to say. Right. So I don't want to hear about the porn no, thing. No, you don't. But is that really the beginning of your career? Yes. Okay, so tell us how you got that. Yeah. Skip over <laughs> the, that thing and then tell, tell us how you... <laughs> it's truly horrific. You'll read it and, and, and you'll understand why Jerry wants me to skip over it. But <laughs> here's what happened. My father who, uh, you know, we rarely had electricity, we rarely had phone service, we'd have to cross the street to avoid Lou the Butcher. He stole my silver dollar collection and used them as dollars to get our electricity back on. Each silver dollar was worth, you know, like 25 bucks. But wow. he, yeah. But he always said to me, figure out what you want to do in life, 
that will make you happy, and then you'll find a way to make money doing it. Mm -hmm. They were not Jewish parents in that they didn't want me to be doctors or lawyers or accountants. They really, my mother wanted me an artist, me to be an artist. My dad said, just find a way to be happy. Dad found a way to be happy, but it didn't figure out a way to make money doing it. And uh, so after graduating film school, I had discovered I was a good cameraman. Mm -hmm. uh, so I bought a, U this is pre-video. There's no video cameras. So I bought a U16 millimeter CP16 reflex. You know, the Mickey Mouse cameras that you would see like in Vietnam War newsreels and right. stuff? Because I felt if I owned a cameraman, if I owned a camera, I could call myself a cameraman without being a dilettante. Uh -huh. And that's and the first job I got because I owned this camera was shooting these nine feature length pornos in 16 millimeters. Well, wait a minute. How? how? <laughs> <laughs> I bought the camera with a uh, with a confused Catholic guy uh, who both was very. Catholic, but also had friends in the porn industry, ah. and uh, he got us a job. Okay. So we had this camera. So that those nine days paid for two thirds of the cost of buying the camera. Okay. But I didn't learn anything doing that. But then I was at here's the origin story. I was at a party one night. Everyone at the party was from Darien, Connecticut except one other Jewish guy who looked like Howard Stern across the room, and that was Joel Cohen. Uh. And I guess we smelled each other. Or, 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 <laughs> I don't know what happened, but we, we met in the middle, and we were talking about Vim Vendors and American Friend, which had just come out, a great movie. And he said that he and his brother Ethan, who is a statistical typist at Macy's, and he had just written this script called Blood Simple, and they were going to raise the 750 grand to make the movie by shooting a trailer like it was a finished film. Uh -huh. And then show dentists and vesting clubs and doctors and stuff like that. Yeah. And the Hadassah group from Minneapolis. Uh, the trailer, because no dentist can read a script and say this is good, right. but they can see a trailer and go, I'd go see that. Right. So I said to Joel, I own a camera. And Joel said, you're hired. So uh, <laughs> I, Joel and Ethan and I uh, shot the trailer and became very good friends. And the trailer was great. It took a year. And we raised the 750 grand, bringing a projector. I was the only one working. I was shooting industrials for Rabbi Gelman Productions. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I, was, I would buy them the, the fresh orange juice, you know, at the, the diner, at the Greek coffee shop. It was always, hey, back, can we have the fresh orange juice? Yeah, Joe, you can. <laughs> and uh, we went, and the first day on the set of Blood Simple, we raised the money. We go to uh, Austin, Texas, where it was written for. The first day on the set of Blood Simple was the first day Joel... Ethan or I had ever been on a movie set. Wow. I didn't work my way up as a camera operator. Joel was never an assistant director. Or Ethan never had produced anything. And uh, my, ex, my ex girlfriend at the, at the time, who was the first assistant director who had worked on films, would say, Oh, this will never, I don't want to rain on your parade, she would say. But this, set won't work, you can't shoot here. And Joel and Ethan and I would say, oh, we'll, we'll shoot here, it'll be fine. And we uh, made Blood Simple, uh, the investors hated it, <laughs> hated it. Two thirds of them walked out. We had an investor screening at the Bombay Movie Theater on 57th, right across from Carnegie Hall, and they left. The movie ended and two thir thirds of them were gone. Wow. But we got into the New York Film Festival and uh, the night it showed, uh, Janet Maslin, who reviewed it, said, these Cohen brothers are going to go far, and the last two paragraphs were all about Barry Sonnenfeld's cinematography. That's a great. So that's the origin story, Jeff. That is fantastic. All right. So yeah. I don't have anything else. Okay. <laughs>
I've got a few things I can say to you. Okay. I think or not. We, yeah, we got another 10 minutes, and then we're going to take some of your questions. So if you want, you, want, you, can, you got some stuff for me? Yes. Okay. That's a great story that I never knew, by the way. One of the few you didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's fantastic. Uh, Did you move by yourself to the city? Yeah. Well, what do you mean? <laughs> Did you have a roommate? No. Where was it? 81st and Columbus. One block. Oh, my God. One block from where I live now. <laughs> but it's a big block. <laughs> <laughs> And do you like duck? I had duck the other night. And uh, yes, I do like it. Let me ask you I this. don't yes. like to kill the duck. I like no. the duck. No. Right. I think the duck really uh, is the perfect model of how to live. Um, paddle as hard as you can beneath the surface. <laughs> Let everything else roll off your back <laughs> and have a little sense of humor about your appearance. <laughs> Did you just make that up? No. <laughs> well, let me ask you this about duck. There are two kinds of duck. There's a duck breast where they say, oh, it's the rare duck breast, and then there's the roasted fall off the bone duck. Do you have a preference? <coughs> Well, this restaurant we went to the other night, which I, I don't really remember the name of it. It's, really, it's a really hot new Chinese restaurant, like on 54th or something. I don't know. My wife always knows the, yeah. these great places. So, um, and I, they brought the duck out, <coughs> and the guy cut it up for the first time, which I never want. Like, you don't really you don't like to see, see that. that. But it was the first time I saw, oh, that's where the meat is from. <laughs> <laughs> but, that, but what are you trying to find out? I'm trying to find out if you like duck. Yes. Listen, you gave me eight minutes of questions to <laughs> ask you, and that's where I'm starting. I could go this way, Chair. If, if you were on a desert island and you could only eat one cuisine the rest of your life. It seems to be very food related, I know, but where are you going? You're going Italian. Obviously. You're going Italian, but it's really Chinese. You think you could yes. last longer with Chinese? It's, it's a, oh, yeah. an easier diet to live with the rest of your life. It's not about what's easy. It's about what tastes good. Right, sure. right. Let me ask you some more questions. Okay. <laughs> well, why, you, don't we, why don't we go to okay, we let's, yeah, a okay, lot of let's, bright yeah. people here. So the way that they... Um, Wait, they here they are. cards of questions? Here they are. Thank you very much. Oh, it's terrible. Well, um, I, I'll, I'll help this question out a little bit. <laughs> um, so you, would, you told the story of how you met the Coen brothers. Yes. R great story, really. I Thanks, love that. Thanks, And um, so this person would like to know what it's like to work with them. What, uh, what is their oh. way of working? Their way of working is that I'm charming and I'm very accessible and they're not. <laughs> now, obviously, this question was asked by Ethan Cohen, who's somewhere in this audience, I think. So here's Joel and Ethan. Uh, they do a set, we do a setup, we do a few takes. Joel turns to Ethan, and Ethan goes, yeah. And then <laughs> that we move on to the next shot. And, and, that, and uh, in fact, on Miller's Crossing, which was the last film I did for them, at the rap party, John Turturro, came up to me. Uh, John plays a whiny gay man uh, in, in the uh, movie and came up to me and said, I want to thank you so much. And I said, oh, uh, it was fine. It was great. He said, no, I want to thank you for my performance. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, I just watched you and imitated you the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're welcome. You're welcome to Turo. <laughs> All right, this, this uh, individual would like to know, I don't know if this is for me or you, but uh, it doesn't say. Oh, this one's for, it wants to know, how, you, how did you stay away from the dark side of uh, the movie business, uh, drugs, and uh, uh, other oh. kinds of... Uh, well, how did you? Then I'll go second. I, I just, 
I just had no interest in it, I guess. I, I, I have a, a friend now, and we talk about this all the time. There was so much drugs around me all the time, and I still have never even seen it. I think people, right. you know, they just, I think, I don't know, if you're into that, uh, people know who else is into it, and if you're not, they know you're not, and they don't even right. offer it to you. For me, it was total fear. Right. I mean, the last thing I would ever want to do would be not in control. Right. I was 30 before Sweetie, my wife, uh, introduced me to, uh, you know, like, <laughs> sex or, uh, <laughs> or alcohol. <laughs> right. In, in that order, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um. What advice are this? Um, what advice do you have for comedians and actors just starting out in the business? Uh, pick one. <laughs> <That's my> advice. <laughs> um, advice, you know, it, it's uh, it's not something it, you choose to do. Uh, either one of those. Michael Richards told me a funny story the other day uh, about someone coming up to him on the street, and and he said. Uh, um, I was thinking about becoming an actor. He says, you'll never make it. <laughs> <laughs> if you even think about thinking about it, it's, it's, it has to be something you can't not do. Would you, right. would, do you feel that you, when did it click in that I, I, I have to do this, I'm going to do this or die? Still haven't. Right. No. Right. Still waiting for that. Still waiting for right. that to happen. No. Um, but I do think that if you, that if I was like a refrigerator repairman, I think I'd be really good at it. I think I'd be a fantastic FedEx guy. I would really? Know, oh God, I would know everyone, and I would go, "Hey, your Amazon thing is here." I know I would be. I would be a whatever I did. I do feel I would put all my being into. Wow. And it just so happens it's the film business, but it could have been anything, really. Right. I, yeah, I think I'm kind of similar. Yeah. Um, what was it like working with Penny Marshall? There's a very uh, mean, long chapter about working <laughs> with Penny in the book, and I only wrote the chapter because she's dead. Otherwise, right. <laughs> I, I feel so sensitive as a person, I would not have been that mean to her if she was alive. And that is it's so nice. I will say that uh, uh, people ask me, because. I'm very mean to my parents in the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, they say, would you have written this book if your parents were alive? And I said, I wish they were. So that they could <laughs> read how mean I am in this book to them. Yeah. Um, it's just so funny how people always ask this, what was it like working with? With? The Joel and he, oh, Penny. No, this one yeah. is about uh, Nicolas Cage. How, what was it like with working with Nick Cage on Raising Arizona? He was fine, you know, he's one of, there are certain actors that you never want to work with who uh, believe in props as acting technique, and Nick always wanted props. There's an insert of a long shoehorn because he thought he should have uh, an infatuation with shoehorns. That's really not what acting is about. I disagree. No, I think I, it is. No. It can't be about shoehorns? <laughs> Comedy is about shoehorns. Right. Acting is about talking very fast. Right. <laughs> it's just all you need to do to be a good actor is talk fast and react. That's not good for a comedian. It's good for acting. But what do you think about shoehorns, Jerry? You, you think that acting... I, th I think that's a totally legitimate thing for an actor to focus on that, that this guy is obsessed with shoehorns, and then they find the character in, in some way in that, in that uh, eccentricity. I think that's a legitimate. I think it's totally legitimate for the guy to be obsessed with shoehorns. Mm -hmm. Just keep it out of the movie. <laughs> Just. <laughs> uh, what characteristic did you inherit from your mother? Profound fear. Uh -huh. uh, you know, uh, when my daughter, Chloe, who's here, uh, flies from, let's say, L.A. to Tokyo, I am on flight aware watching her flight for the 14 hours going, 
Why are they going from 37,000 feet to 36,800 feet for no reason? They're over the Pacific Ocean, and I live in total fear until she lands, and then she texts me, and then I go to sleep. Right. So I learned about fear from my mother. Uh, this is a, a question for me. Do I have a theory as to why so many funny people are from Long Island? <laughs> I don't, I don't know if that's true. I, I do think there's a lot of talent in Long Island. I think it's probably you have, uh, you know, if I look at, if you look at kind of the gene pool of New York City, and then you have these people that kind of got thrown off, kind of in a, as a centrifuge would, would just, uh, you know, certain, would cast off a certain amount. Yeah. And then they're kind of trapped in this Petri dish of Long Island that's surrounded by water, and so it's protected from any healthy influence <laughs> of the mainstream American culture. And so they, they grew up. Uh, it, it is a hothouse of eccentricity. And uh, I didn't realize it growing up there, but a lot of people, I, I have a friend mm -hmm. uh, who's from Long Island that I spend a lot of time with. Now, you know my friend Johnny Muse. Yeah. And he's a, he's a tree guy. He owns a tree farm. Right. And I find him as funny as anybody I've ever met right. in comedy because he's from Long Island. And, and you in, don't... if you are from Long Island, you're probably 50% funnier than everybody else in America. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you don't think it's because people on Long Island don't care about their children. You don't think it, it, no. it's not that. Right. No, I, and it doesn't work with New Jersey for some reason. <laughs> you have to go to yeah, Long Island. Yeah, I, Long I have Island. a bit about that we lived in the city, but if you move out of the city, you live on Long Island. That's right. That you don't live in it, you live on it. Same with, you talk about trains also. Yes, and we right. would get on the train. You don't get in the train. You don't get train. in the train. Right. You That's get on right. the train, even though there's nobody on the train. They're, they're all in the train. <laughs> right. And then you get off the train and get in the cab, even though you got on, on the train. On the train. I, yeah. I love that. I, yeah. yeah. Uh, this is a reminder. Copies of Call Your Mother are available for sale, and Barry will be signing them afterwards. Well, that's nice. Yeah. And that's, oh, those are all the questions that I have. Well, maybe we can uh, take a couple from the... From the audience, anything? Uh, yes? Go ahead. Yes, we're right there. Yell it out. Yeah. Give me. What do you expect to see a long, happy marriage? A long, happy marriage. Well, it's uh, the, the key to marriage, of course, <laughs> is to make the other person happy. I tell all my uh, guy friends, make your wife happy, you're not going to be happy, so don't even worry about that. <laughs> and that's good, because that cuts your work in half. <laughs> and further, that men don't want to be happy. Uh, we don't know what it is. <laughs> we don't care what it is. We've never experienced it and couldn't be less interested in it. <laughs> what he we said. We just want to do whatever stupid thing it is that we're doing. That's <laughs> uh, one over there. How did you hook up with... Uh, uh, I'll let you change that phraseology. <laughs> right. Start over. <laughs> well, Larry is a stand-up comic. <laughs> oh, so this is really more about you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I see. I understand. I understand your purpose in this question. <laughs> yes. A social misfit. Really? Yes. Uh, I knew Larry from the uh, stand-up scene in New York in the 70s, and uh, we were friends. So, um, and you know this story, right? Everybody knows this story, that I had this meeting at NBC uh, about doing a, some kind of show, and they said, what kind of show do you want to do? And I said, I, I don't have any ideas. I just always wanted to have a meeting like this. <laughs> <laughs> and I was at Catch a Rising Star. Some older people might remember that club on the Upper East Side. Right. And uh, I was telling Larry the story. And uh, then we went across the street to Mr. Lee's 
a Korean deli, and we were getting something to eat because we didn't do drugs either. Right. And uh, we were eating, and we were making fun of all the Korean crazy things that they would always have by the cash register, those weird fig Newtons with no label on them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we were laughing and having fun, and Larry says, this is what the show should be. It should be right. just two comedians walking around making fun of things. Right. And I said, I like that. <laughs> and that is actually how it started. Mm -hmm. And the character of George was originally a comedian when we first wrote it, and that's what the show was going to be. And then we, you know, just developed it from there. But that's how it happened. Yes, dear. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm a listener from Long Island. Okay. Right now. And my birthday. So. Happy birthday. Oh, thank you. Right. You see the Long Island mentality. <laughs> it's all about me. <laughs> sure, I love chocolate popcorn. I would definitely eat it. Yeah. Not if some stranger handed it to me, of course. <laughs> yeah. So. Now, do you remember Flakowitz? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, yeah. is that a place? Uh, Flakowitz was a great bakery around exit 106, 10, uh, around 106, 107 off of the LIE ah. that made an amazing raisin pumpernickel. Wow. True story, Jer. <laughs> uh, yes, this young lady? Well, finding something funny is just something that you're born with. Uh, but the writing, my writing process is you take that thing um, and then you, you just say, okay, I'm going to work on this thing for this period of time and I'm not going to do anything else. I'm not going to talk on the phone or look at the internet. And, and I mean, I've been doing this since before those th things existed. And uh, so it's really just the secret of writing, I think, and this is what I, this is my dream that I have of teaching this class. Here's the, here's the great thing about writing. You don't have to do it. All you have to do is not do anything else in that time frame. So you put your idea down and now you don't have to do anything. <laughs> you just sit there and you eventually will realize there's a problem here, <laughs> right? <laughs> and your brain will naturally try and solve the problem, and the next thing you know, you're writing. So it's not about forcing yourself to write, it's about creating a, uh, what do we call it, a, a discrete space, is that, is that sure. the right word? So that's how you write. Create a place and time where that's what's happening, but you don't have to write. Just be there with the problem. That's my writing technique. Wow, you could be a teacher at NYU. Really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, with the cap. Yeah, ah. Florida. Yeah. <laughs> well, first we try to, uh, the, the question is how do I determine which cities to go to uh, to perform. Well, first, the, the first thing I ask is, do they use American money? <laughs> and if the answer is yes, we go there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I grew up in an era when um, we, uh, we had to learn to do comedy for any audience. You, you know, the biggest job you could get in the 70s or 80s would be opening for Frankie Valli, which I did a lot of, or Tom Jones or Diana Ross. And you would walk out in front of their audience who did not want to see you at all. <clears throat> and if you could make them laugh, then you worked. And so that was always, you know, comedians today develop a following very quickly. And next thing you know, you're playing to your following, which is very different than playing to a general audience that doesn't even want to hear you. So, um, no, I, I mean, we, there's no place that I do or don't want to go. Jerry would send me uh, photos from motels <laughs> throughout the United States 
uh, and you, I promise you, there's no place he won't go. Yeah. Based on these uh, photos of you know uh, the Quad Cities in Iowa. Yeah. 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 Anyway, and anywhere. It's it's about the um, the experience of the of the show. It's not about the, the the particular city. It doesn't matter. It's what happens in that room. Yes, sir. Yes, it is. <laughs> oh, that's not Jerry's fault. That's a good question. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> thank you, Jerry. Uh, well, my favorite cinematographer was Gordon Willis. Uh, I thought he uh, he shot the Woody Allen films and the Godfather movies, and shot a movie very few people saw called Pennies from Heaven. Uh, Steve Martin? Steve Martin. Right. Yeah, really good movie that no one, that you saw. Right. But um, uh, I, here's the thing. I'm a Jewish person. I'm, I'm an only child of Jewish persuasion. I want to be noticed. And for me, using the camera was a way to be noticed. So instead of using the camera as a recording device, I use it as a character in the movie. So if you see Throw Mama from the Train or you see uh, Raising Arizona or some of the movies I shot uh, directed Adam's Family, the camera is literally a character in the movie. Yeah. You know, it races in or there's a shot in, in Blood Simple where the camera's tracking uh, along the bar but there's a drunk asleep on the bar and the camera booms up over the drunk and continues. <laughs> um, so for me it was my way of being an actor without having to be an actor. Uh -huh. So I love that the camera can be a character in the movie. So. Uh, there, there really weren't a lot of cameramen that were doing what I think I was trying to do and what Joel and Ethan uh, did with me, which is really use the camera as a storytelling device instead of a recording device. Ah, that's great. What was the biggest fight you guys ever had? Always about money. <laughs> uh, I remember on Raising Arizona, and, and again, I don't know if Ethan is here tonight, but on Raising Arizona, I was really mad because Joel, uh, Ethan had said to me, we're going to pay you, I think it was $2,600 a week to be the cameraman, and uh, that's all we can afford, and I don't want to discuss it with you, but I promise you, no one will get more money than you do as uh, on the crew. And then... Again, my former ex-girlfriend, Debbie Reinish, the grips, the electricians, were all making more than I was. <laughs> and I went to Ethan and I said, hey, you know, you promised I want more money. You know, we're four weeks into shooting, you promised I would be the highest paid crew member, and everyone's making more than I am. And Ethan said, no, you, you agreed to 2,600 a week. And I said, but you said, that you couldn't afford anymore, and no one else was gonna get more than I was. And he said, well, that was just my opening bargaining position. You, you accepted it. <laughs> so, in fact, Joel was so angry at me because I was so bitter while shooting Raising Arizona that he, he said, you're as bad, and he mentioned this guy that uh, we all knew that used to lick his finger and put it in the sugar bowl. <laughs> anyway, it was like, so, Anyway, so it was always about money. Right. But we always got along except for that. Right. Yeah. Well, it was an incredible creative uh, uh, synthesis you guys had together. When I saw that movie, I was so excited uh, by the camera work and, and, the, and the acting style, but yeah. e equally both. And uh, so did, would go? you say that yeah. you both would generate the, uh, yeah. the ideas for the shots? We, we always uh, work together in pre-production, way bo months before. The, the one place you don't want to make decisions when you're working on a movie is on a movie set. Because mm -hmm. it's expensive and the grips right. are laying on furniture blankets or playing frisbee while you're trying to figure stuff out. So Joel and Ethan and I would spend months before we ever started to shoot with Joel and Ethan pacing, their pacers, uh, designing shots, mm -hmm. just designing shots and figuring stuff out. And then uh, I would pick the lenses, which was always a very wide angle lens, because wide angle lenses have a lot of energy. You very quickly, uh -huh. like with a 21 millimeter, I'm seeing your whole body from your head to the sh your shoes. 
And in this little move, now I'm in a close-up of you. Ah. With a long lens, with a telephoto lens, the audience feels distance uh, and feels not involved. So that's something I sort of did with Joel and Ethan, and we all loved it, and that's what happened. So we, we designed it together. Great. All right, we have time all for right. one more question. Yes, over here. Hello. Question for Mr. Barry. Do you have any uh, next uh, film or TV shows as a comedy coming in, and uh, if you will hire a Latina woman for your comedy show? Uh, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> uh, uh, there's something I'm, I'm, I might be doing, but uh, as Jerry knows in this business, and Jerry doesn't know this. What am I? Who am I fooling? Uh, <laughs> Whatever Jerry wants to do, he does. But uh, in, in my case, until it happens, it's not happening. But yes, maybe. So you'll, you'll buy a book and, and, uh, and, uh, and let's see what happens. <laughs> yes. Uh, get shorty. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh, what's interesting about Get Shorty is that no one wanted to make it. It took Danny DeVito and myself about six years to get get it made. No movie ever made from an Elmore Len Leonard novel had ever made money. No one wanted to make movies about inside Hollywood. I write about it in the book. There are a couple of Get Shorty chapters. The first half of the book is about growing up in Washington Heights, where we also had some funny people, Jer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Heights was like a, a disgusting Long Island, actually. <laughs> um, and the second half is about uh, some, some of the movies I shot and directed. But uh, Get Shorty is an example that you just got to keep per persevering. Everyone turned us down. Everyone, studio heads changed, and the new studio head would turn us down, and eventually, a studio said yes, and we got to make Get Shorty. And, and now I'll say, hey, you should do this. It's like Get Shorty. Uh, and they go, well, Get Shorty was a slam dunk. And I said, well, you passed on it twice, so it wasn't that much of a slam dunk. So for me, Get Shorty. So Barry is going to be out front after uh, we're done here, and he's going to be uh, selling and signing books. And uh, we thank you all for coming. We hope thank you, you enjoyed Jerry. our talk. And thank you.